Up next is our final guest this morning. She is the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education. Please welcome Catherine E. Lehman. Secretary Lehman, welcome to Axios. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, today's a big day for you, but I want to get to that a little bit later. <laughs> uh, I want to start by asking you a little bit about the fact that your office has been the one fielding all of the cases and complaints that have come out of campuses in these last, you know, several months of turmoil. Yes. Obviously not speaking to any particular case, but high level, what is your sense of the campus climate based on what you've seen come across your desk? I am a lifelong civil rights lawyer and a lifelong civil rights enforcer, and I am shocked and appalled by the quantum of discrimination that we see in schools. Certainly many of us have read about it and heard about it in the news. What I see in the investigations that we conduct in schools is astonishing to me about the degree to which in the country right now, we think it's okay to tell someone that they're not valid because of who they are, they're not welcome because of who they are, and that they shouldn't be part of a campus community. It's, it's astonishing to me, and I think it's a new low. And, and you're seeing an increasing number of these, right? It's in, during your tenure, even? Oh, it's an enormous increase. Uh, just in the time since October 7th, we have now uh, some 150 cases in investigation. We've re recently resolved about 15 cases, uh, and the cases just keep coming. And I, and, you know, I, I think that understates the quantum of harm that people experience. Not everybody decides to come to the federal government for redress. Not everybody decides to use uh, uh, the complaint process that we have. And because you've got all this data and your office sees exactly how these disputes over free speech kind of play out and how hate on campus is actually affecting students, can you tell us a bit about the stakes here? Like what, I mean, you mentioned a little bit, what exactly is keeping you up at night? Well, I, I, I want to take a step back, if I can, too. Uh, certainly, we see a ton of concern about free speech. I also think that there is astonishing misconception, that there is some kind of contrast or divide between protecting, respecting free speech rights and not discriminating. There is no necessary conflict between respecting and protecting our fundamental free speech rights and protecting every student's right to be in school, to learn in an environment where the student isn't discriminated against because of who the student is. And so I, I think one of the things that I'm so astonished by is the degree of um, paralysis on that question, where, where uh, I see so many universities taking the position that they can't even address something because it's speech. And actually, that's not right. It may be that you can't discipline the speaker because the speech is protected, and, and you know, I support that. But that's not the end of the inquiry. The inquiry has to also be are the students who are Jewish, are the students who are Palestinian, are the students who are Arab on campus safe? Do they feel like they can learn? Do they feel like they can access the entire educational community? And are they experiencing discrimination? And, and the, one of the tests that we use is to evaluate whether the conduct, and that can include speech, is so severe or pervasive that it limits or denies access to education. So if the conduct rises to that level, including speech, then a, a university must act to make sure that a student is still able to access education. And, and that we just, we can't lose sight of that. So, you know, it, it, it's such an important part of learning and, and part of the educational experience in college to recognize how to have difficult conversations, you know, how to talk about topics about which people very strongly disagree. It's also incredibly important just to be able to access math class just to be able to access the education that you signed up for. What does that look like from the university's perspective? Like, what are some of the steps they can take to make sure that they are making students feel like they can go to math class? Right. Well, I, I think a, a baseline and a core expectation for every school is to communicate their inclusive values, to, inc to communicate to the students, we admitted you because we want you. We expect you to succeed here, and we will support you when we're ready for you. That, that should be just the, the ways that, that college start as a baseline. And then where there's difficult conversations, where there are incidents, where there are protests, where there, you know, where there are 
parts of the daily life of education, actually, and, and certainly in the time that we're in now. The colleges also need to be able to assess, did this conduct in the totality of the circumstances, so this or this and the last week and the, and the week before uh, sets of conduct, does that rise to the level that there are students who are unable to access their education? And if so, what are the steps that we can take to support those students so they can? And that might be counseling, that might be creating other conversations, that, that might be telling students how to file a discrimination complaint and how to access uh, the university resources on that. Uh, it, it isn't to silence a speaker who has a right to speak, but it is still to make sure that all of the students in a campus community are fully supported and fully able to be part of that community. What's your advice to students heading into the fall who might feel strongly about the election or about the Israel-Hamas war and want to, in good faith, express their passionate views and you know, do right by their classmates as well? Well, I hope they'll do exactly what you just said, express yeah. their passionate views and do right by their classmates as well. And, you know, we were hearing a lot about that in, uh, in this session today. It's been a very interesting conversation, I think. And, and I think it's important for us to recognize there are ways to have those conversations. There are ways to be yourself at school. There are ways to be part of a community that is vibrant and thriving and uh, discussing the issues of the day. That's, that's what I want for my daughter, who's a college student. That's what I uh, hope for, for every college student everywhere. But there's a way to support that and to make sure that that is possible and that, that students aren't barred from accessing the library, that they aren't barred from going to class, that they don't have to hear over and over slurs about who they are uh, because of someone's stereotypes about who they are, that, that they're actually able to, to be part of a vibrant intellectual community, which is college. Is it about teaching students how to protest? Well, at minimum, sure. It's also about teaching students how to be uh, part of an intellectual community, how to debate, how to, how, to, how to learn and how to, to share ideas, how to be open to somebody else's ideas, how to, how to stretch your mind. That's what college is. So I want to get to, uh, we have a news peg today. Today is, well, one of the biggest moves during your tenure has been some key changes to the Title IX regulations. That's right. And it's a years-long process that went into effect this morning. Yes. So congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to get into one of the, the bigger changes within those regulations, which was how sexual harassment on campus is dealt with and what the university's purview is. Can you explain a little bit and, about what changed and why it's important? Well, sure. And just to say, since we're, we're shifting topics a little bit, we're talking about Title IX of the Education Amendments uh, of 1972, and uh, they protect against sex discrimination in school. The beautiful, now 52-year-old guarantee from Congress is that no person shall experience discrimination on the basis of sex. And what we did in these new regulations that take effect today in 24 states and the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico uh, is to put in the reg text what that guarantee means, and to say explicitly in law that the protection against sex discrimination extends to all forms of sex discrimination. And specifically with respect to sex-based harassment, uh, we, are, we are clear that any student can experience sex-based harassment. We are clear about the standards that schools need to use to evaluate that harassment and to make sure that harassment doesn't impede a student's access to education. So we're, we're I am very excited about the states that will implement it. I look forward to continuing to defend this, and I'm very proud that these new regulations are the most comprehensive regulations since 1975 when the department first regulated. Thank you. Thank you. And there's also a piece that expands protection for LGBTQ plus students, right? Well, to be clear, uh, that piece puts in the regulation that protection. It's always been there. That's what the law has been, but there's been quite a bit of confusion about that. And so we thought it was important to make it clear and to make sure that no student and no school misunderstands that the promise in the statute that no person experiences discrimination very much extends to LGBTQI plus persons who are people too. Absolutely. Uh, at Axios, we're all about few words, but sometimes more words are better. <laughs> uh, I want to end with one fun thing. Um, I, we talked about this a little bit backstage. In the interest of free speech, what is your hottest take about D.C.? I guess As my a California about native. D.C. is that it's hot. I'm from California. This is a lot. You know? <laughs> but I also I am from California, and it's really nice to be able to enjoy the public transportation and the many free museums and the public art that is available in D.C. too. So... Uh, I do believe that any responsible federal government would have been cited in California, but I'll take D.C. as a second vote. <laughs> Thank you so much, Secretary Lehman. That is all the time we have. Uh, thank, thank you, you so very much. much.